Hi, this is going to be AC network analysis. We're going to learn how to solve for steady state voltages and currents at different points in a circuit that has passives, resistors, but also inductors and capacitors, and sinusoidal supplies. So let's introduce slash remind what a phaser is. So if you've got a time domain signal, something like 5 volts cos, uh, whoops, cos of omega t plus phi, and you want to convert that to a phaser, what you do is you only use the amplitude phi volts and the phase in a complex exponential there. So phi volts e to the j phi, that's the right Greek letter there. And to go the opposite direction, from a phaser representation, of V equals five volts E to the J um, times phi. Then the time domain, time domain representation. So the time domain signal that this phaser is, is actually representing is V at T is equal to the real part of the phaser after you multiply back in the complex time dependence. So let's work that out. The real part of phi volts e to the j phi times e to the j omega t. So just substituted in the, the phaser that we just had. And that'll be e to the 5 volts sorry, the real part of 5 volts times e to the j omega t plus phi, combining those exponents. Now we'll use Euler's identity, which says that the complex exponential is the same as cos of the argument besides the complex number, omega t plus phi, plus j times the sine of omega t plus phi. Now j, oh, by the way, I guess I should mention that j is defined as the square root of negative one. That's the symbol that we're using for the imaginary number here. So real part of five volts cos omega t plus phi plus j sine of omega t plus phi. This part's all imaginary and this part with the cosine is all real. So we're gonna be left with five volts cos omega t plus phi. Yeah, so that's how you go from a time domain signal to its phaser representation, and how you go from its phaser representation to its time domain signal. So the reason you'd wanna use phasers is because they allow you to turn differential equations into algebraic equations when it comes to inductors and capacitors. So uh, an inductor has a voltage across it given by inductance times the derivative of the current going through it, while a capacitor has a current going through it, which is given by the capacitance times the derivative of the voltage across it with respect to time. So given that these are the case, what we're gonna do now is point out that if you define a complex impedance for an inductor as J omega times L and a complex impedance for a capacitor as one over J omega C, then you can define an Ohm's law in terms of the phaser representations that VL is equal to ZL times IL, and it will be equivalent to doing the differential equation in the time domain. So let's, let's have a look at this. Suppose that IL is equal to, let's say, I times cos omega t plus phi. Let's just call this like a, a current magnitude here. Or I don't know, like maybe one, one amp. Yeah. Okay, so suppose that this is the function for the current going through an inductor as a function of time. Then the phasor Oh, I guess I should say that this is, uh, suppose that this is the actual current going through the inductor, which would have a phasor representation of IL is equal to one amp times E to the 
j phi. Yeah. So what our new Ohm's law with complex impedance would say is that the voltage phasor would just be equal to j omega l times i l, which is equal to j omega l times 1 amp e to the j omega e to the j phi. So if we wanted to know what the voltage is using this definition and the phasor method, we would just multiply it by j omega l multiply the current phasor by j omega l to get the voltage phasor. And now that we've got the voltage phasor, we can take the real part of this multiplied by the time dependence. So that would be the real part of j omega l times 1 amp multiplied by e to the j phi multiplied by e to the j omega t. Okay. So before we do this, it's going to be a little bit more convenient to bring this j which is, a, which is a complex number here, up into the exponent there. So that is the same by Euler, Euler's identity again as e to the j pi by 2. So what we end up with is, is really omega L times 1 amp multiplied by cosine of omega t plus phi plus pi by 2. All right. So that's what the phasor representation says we get. It says we get a cosine signal multi, uh, of 1 amp, so the same as the, as the current that we started with, except it's phase shifted by pi by 2. So adding in here means that the time that it occurs that uh, that a given part occurs at would be um, shifted to the left so it occurs earlier this is a this is a forward thing in time and that tells us that the voltage across an inductor has to be ahead of the actual current going through it and that kind of makes sense because the voltage is given by the rate of change of the current. So if the current is increasing, then the voltage must uh, must be positive already. So if the voltage is positive, the current's increasing, which means it's not necessarily at its max yet, it's approaching its, its max, if we've got a sinusoidal signal there. Okay, so then we've got the, the last part is to double check that this actually goes back to what's going on with the differential equation, that this is actually consistent with our differential equation. So what we would do is see what the differential equation says about this representation. So it says VL is equal to L times DI by DT, which would be the derivative of this thing, 1 amp cos omega T plus phi. And that would be L times 1 amp oops, amp, and derivative of cosine would be negative omega sine of omega t plus phi. Okay, well, a negative sine is actually a phase-shifted cosine. Specifically, by a quarter of a cycle. So if we take our cosine function and you shift it to the left by a quarter cycle, then that will match up exactly with a negative sine function. And and now we have exactly the same signal as we found using the phasor representation. So the phasor converting to a phasor and then finding the uh, voltage and then converting back in this example was more time. But the key part is that once you're in the phasor domain to go from the current to the voltage is only a multiplication. And that's what's going to make things much, much faster when you try and do a full circuit like this. So although we only proved it for inductors, maybe you can check it out for capacitors and see that this is the complex impedance for capacitors. This is the complex impedance for inductors. So once you've converted all, it all into complex impedances,
since they obey Ohm's law, and since we still have Kirchhoff's laws working, that the, the sum of the voltages around any closed loop have to be zero, and the, the sum of the currents entering any node has to be zero. So those laws will still work. Ohm's law with complex impedance is what, we, what we've established using phasers. So we can convert everything to impedances and then do exactly what we would have done for resistors. So if things are in series, then we can add them, add their impedances together. If they're in parallel, we can treat them like we did resistors in parallel just with complex numbers. And we can even jump right to using things like the voltage divider. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll have the conversion of everything into complex impedances by first defining the frequency 4E3, and that means omega is equal to 2 times pi times F. And we can figure out ZC is equal to, now for maple, the complex number, the square root of negative 1, is the capital I, which is a little unfortunate for circuits, but um, it still is a pretty convenient calculator. So we've got negative I over omega times C. Oh, and by the way, that is the same as if we were to say 1 over I times omega times C. So I'll hit enter here and it doesn't change. Right. So you can put the I in the denominator or just say that it's negative an I in the numerator. So that's how the complex number term works. Okay. Uh, that's ZC. We'll need to define the capacitance and the inductance and the resistances. And we'll just, why don't we go ahead and combine R1 and R2 right away into R12. So then we'll be, we'll be all ready to go here. So we've got our capacitance determined. We've got, uh, and from that, we've got the complex impedance of it. We can find the complex impedance of the inductor. I omega L. There's that one. So it's a much higher number and the opposite sign from the capacitive impedance. And now if we want to know what VB is, we can define VA. That's just across the source. So that would have a phasor representation of just two, no phase. So when multisim says two volts peak, it's not peak to peak, it's two volts from zero to peak. So this is the amplitude then. And that means VB from a voltage divider would be this whole thing in parallel divided by this thing in parallel plus this times VA. So let's go ahead and write out what that impedance would be in parallel. Z pair would equal R3. So 1 over R3 plus 1 over ZL plus R12. And then we're going to go 1 over that whole thing. Okay, so there's our parallel impedance, and that means VB would be equal to this. So now the, the number here is in rectangular form. We can convert it to polar form by using some maple commands here. So uh, the magnitude of that would be abs of VB. And this is the same as taking the root of the square of the real part added to the square of the imaginary part. And the phase of that would be the argument of VB. This is in radians. So we see we're at 0.384. So it's more real than it is imaginary. And it's rotated in the counterclockwise direction a little bit. So this means rotating in the counterclockwise direction, this positive phase represents a lead. So that's sort of happening forward in time. It means that the voltage at point B gets to its peak a little bit ahead of the voltage at point A. How much ahead, we're going to need to figure out what fraction of a full cycle this is. So the phase divided by 2 pi would be the fraction of a full cycle. Let's say frac is equal to the last thing that we calculated, 
divided by 2 times 3.14159, and we'll get this. So that's about 6% of a full cycle is this phase. And if we want to know what time that corresponds to, we'll take that and then multiply it by the period. So the period is 1 over the frequency, so we get 15.3 microseconds. Okay, now a shortcut to go from the phase to the amount of time, you could think, hey, let's just do this all in one step. So why don't we just take that and multiply by the period directly? Or in fact, divide by the frequency. And hey, 2 pi frequency, that's just omega. So that doesn't change the, the fraction that we're dealing with there. So I mean, it's not, it's not called fraction anymore. This is the delta t. But the point is you can get it rather than dividing by 2 pi and then multiplying by period, you can just divide by the, the angular frequency. To see why that works, one other way to rewrite the voltage signal that we started with here is if you want to know what phase, how the phase corresponds to a time difference, just think about factoring out omega from this. And you see in time terms, the phase is written as phi divided by omega. Okay, so there we have it. The last thing to do is to find what the voltage at C is and what the current through the inductor is. So we could figure out what VC would be by another voltage divider, this time R12 over ZL plus R12 times VB. And we can figure out what the current across current through the inductor would be if we take the voltage across it. So we could take IL is equal to VB minus VC divided by ZL. That's a way to find that current. Okay, so there we go. There's our VC and our IL. Similarly, we're going to want to find the magnitude and phase of these. So abs of VC and argument VC. And then we'll take the delta T VC is equal to that divided by omega. And same thing for IL. Okay, so what we've got is that VC has a, a magnitude of 51.7 millivolts. So it's much smaller than the, the signals that we had earlier. So 1.88 versus uh, 0 0.051. And then IL is best measured in, in microamps there and has a delay of 46 microseconds. So let's check the uh, let's check the leads versus lags in this circuit. All right, so this is this is the answer to the question, but now, now let's think about it a little bit. So we found that this, signal, so the current going through the inductor, has a lag of 46 microseconds. It's 46 microseconds behind the voltage at the start, VA, whereas VB was actually 15 microseconds ahead of the voltage at A. How the inductor works is it's delaying the current changing through it until the the voltage has been there for a while. So remember the state equation for the inductor is that the voltage is the derivative of the current. So when the current is rising the most, which is when it crosses the axis for a sinusoid, the voltage should be at a max. When the current reaches its max, the voltage, the derivative of the current, should have gone down to zero. And then when the current is falling the most when it crosses the axis again, the voltage should be at its minimum, which means that we expect a 90 degree difference. We expect the voltage across an inductor to be exactly 90 degrees ahead of the current through it. And that's exactly what we found when we took those derivatives earlier too. So let's see if that is the case using the, using the phasers that we found here. So what we'll do is 
write out what this voltage across the inductor is. So we might call that VL is equal to this. And we can determine its magnitude and phase. as follows. So now that we've got this phase, we can subtract it from the current phase to look at the difference of those. So we expect that the voltage is 90 degrees ahead of the current. So why don't we actually take argument IL and subtract argument VL and see what we get. Okay, so the current minus the voltage is giving us negative 1.57 radians. So 1.57 you might recognize as pi by 2. So that means that the current relative to the voltage has a negative 90 degree phase difference. So the voltage would be positive 90 degrees relative to the current. The voltage is ahead of the current by a quarter cycle. And that's it. So what we did was introduce phasers, explain how they work, and, uh, and a little bit of why they work, and then how you would use them to do some AC network analysis. Because they're just repeating Ohm's law, although we used the voltage divider rule, you could still use anything like mesh analysis, node analysis, superposition, all of this is still going to be linear in order to solve more complicated circuits. In this example, they only asked us to find the amplitude and phase of the voltages, which means we didn't even need to convert back into the time domain signal that we started with. If we needed to do that, we would take the phasers that we found from their magnitude and phase and then convert them back using this exact same phaser conversion formula over here, that it's the real part of the phaser multiplied by the complex time dependence. Thanks for watching.